Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and for your mercy that endures forever and ever and ever. Father, we thank you that you not leave us, do not leave us in the dark, but we walk in the light as you are in the light. Father, we thank you for wisdom and understanding of the times and seasons that we live in. Thank you, Lord, that your will and your plan is taking place in this earth regardless of what it looks like. Regardless of the condition of the church today, Lord, we know that it's not helpless nor impossible. For Lord, Lazarus was in the grave for four days, dead. But you spoke and you called his name and you called him out. And you spoke to the prophet and told him and took him by the Spirit to the valley of the dry bones. And you asked him, can these bones live? And he responded to you and said, Lord, thou knowest. Because from a natural perspective, he could see no way that those dry bones in the desert could live. But you told him to command those bones and what to command them. And when he commanded them with the anointing of God, they became a mighty, strong army. And Father, even though it seems like that we're in the valley of the dry bones, we thank you today that your wisdom and revelation and your anointing will be upon us and that we will speak as the oracles of God and call forth those things that you desire to take place and come to pass in this earth. And Lord, tonight as we reverently and humbly approach your word, we thank you for revelation of your word, illustration of your word, and impartations of the Spirit of God that enable us to walk out what we have heard. And Father, we're careful to give you the glory, honor, and praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. It's good to see all of you out this evening in this uh, weather. I think they have a, I know down there where they got what they call a weather watch. What do they call that thing? Weather, winter storm watch. Yes, out and uh, about bad weather and everything. In fact, uh, Chris was going to have Chris do something yesterday and go somewhere, but then decided I didn't want him to scatter parts in our truck and all that stuff that he would be taking. And because, you know, he's a, a city boy trying to be a country boy. So, you know, you got to know what you're doing when you get out there on that kind of stuff. And so we just said, nope, you stay. Don't go nowhere because I don't want you scattering parts nowhere, especially the parts of the vehicle, you know. <laughs> because they're predicting ice and all that stuff. So I drove my snowmobile, so I'm ready for you guys. I know y'all. I know how y'all do it. You know, the Lord is so very good. Today, this afternoon, he just, uh, we just had a wonderful time together. I'm just telling you, the Lord just really ministered to me and really encouraged me because I always go back and critique myself because I think it's wise to do so. And the reason for it is that uh, when I was in Dad Hagen's meetings years ago and he would call on me to speak or he, he most of the time it was impromptu. But in the latter times that I spoke, he would call me on the phone or talk to me or something and, and tell me, you know, that I want you to speak at a certain service. But in the beginning of him calling on me and, you know, I was a testimony boy, sharing my testimony which is everybody's got a testimony. I'll always share my testimony, you know, and thank God for that. But, and I knew uh, kind of what he wanted, you know, and, and that's how you have longevity with Dad Hagen. <laughs> it is. If you don't pick up in the spirit what he's wanting you to do, of course, he, he gives you an indication, and he just expects you to follow. You don't see him no more. You might see him one and gone, but uh, he just don't do it. So anyway... What I would, I would share at his camp meetings, we're talking about critiquing myself, you know, looking at myself, examining myself, you know, not in a bad way, not putting myself down, but just talking to the Lord about things and about ministry and ways to communicate things and some things to say, some things not to say, because you need to know as much when not to say something as when you should say something, because there's wisdom in that. Sometimes it's just best, don't say it, you know. Like I was going to say something this morning, I had a check in my spirit, I said, I'm not going to say that. Because I just sensed I shouldn't. But I, that started way back then in camp meeting. I'd get up there and I'd preach, you know, or if you call it, share my testimony, you know. But the preaching anointing would be on me sharing it. 
And uh, when I would get through, after a while, you know, after basking in that anointing, because the anointing would be there, and uh, the Lord would say things to me like this. He'd say, now you've done well, and you, you've done what the prophet asked you to do. And he said, but, he said, when you speak again, he said, do not say, and he would tell me a phrase, or sometimes several phrases, do not say these words anymore. And I'd say, oh, Lord, I'm sorry. I mean, it was like he hit me with a ball bat. I mean, he, that wasn't what he was doing. And I would say, Lord, why? Why? Lord, I, don't, I, I mean, I'm going to do what you said, but why? He said, because this is not your meeting. This is not your meeting. And it wasn't. It was not my meeting. He said, you're here as the, in the ministry of helps. Even though you stand in the office, you're in the ministry of helps to help him. You're not here to build your ministry. In any way, you to help him build his ministry and strengthen him personally. You're not here to do it. And then sometimes he would tell me, don't tell that illustration anymore. That's what the Lord would say. In a, in a nice way, not gruff. And of course, I'd repent. I'd be very sorrowful. And I'd just say, oh, Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, if you give me one more chance, I'll get it right. You know, And that's why I know he'll give you a chance. He'll give you opportunity. But he would say things to me, don't tell that illustration no more. Well, I wouldn't know why. And so I'd just inquire, you know, nicely to the Lord. And, and the Lord would say, because you're speaking to an international audience. People came from all over the world. Sometimes in camp meeting, every inhabited continent on the planet would be represented there. I think one time they might have had that guy from Antarctica. I don't know. But anyway, it would be, and he said, most of these people, some of these people do not understand that uh, an illustration, but they can call it colloquial expression. And he said, because of the foreign countries they're from, and you'll bring more confusion, and you'll cause trouble for Dad Hagen, who you call Dad Hagen. Because he'll have to straighten this out in the spirit. And I'd say, Lord, I won't, I won't do that. And it wasn't that I was sure. I wasn't cussing or nothing. You know what I mean? It wasn't that. It was just little things like that. And so I realized from that time, I started to critique in myself and talking to the Lord about it. Lord, what do you think about this? And Lord, what do you think about that? You know, and you can talk to him about you, but you might not want to. <laughs> Jeremiah chapter 23. We'll just shut up right there. How about that? That's what you came for tonight, remember? You might have danced out of here this morning. And we're just going to hit some high points and just move on because we're talking about this. Remember how we got into Jeremiah 23. It's because in, in prayer this morning, meditation, just seeking the Lord, the Lord said you're going to begin in the book of, of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 23. He said you're going to begin, this is the way he said it, exactly. You're going to begin in Jeremiah chapter 23. Now I didn't know exactly what I was going to, I mean I've read it before, but I didn't really know what I was going to read, you know, in detail until we got into it, because we didn't read the whole chapter. You can read it later. But he began to talk to me, and of course, what, you know, to start there and share, and what he began to talk about, about how the body of Christ needs correction, uh, you know, as a whole, and it doesn't mean that everybody's wrong. We've already understood that. It doesn't mean that we know it all. It doesn't mean that we know it all. But there's times that things need to be said to bring things in God's divine order. There's man's order. There's the world's order. And there's God's divine order. And God's divine order is not being held as a standard in the church world as a whole. And God is endeavoring to bring the church into the place that it should so that His glory can be poured out into this earth so that we will be good stewards over the anointing and the doctrines and truths of His Word. So He had us turn here to Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 1. He said, Woe be unto the pastors. In other words, watch out, you better look out. That destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. And so we see what he said about the pastors. But it's not just the pastors. He's talking about uh, all the ministry offices, you understand. Not just pastors. So don't get that, you know, in your mind. Because the five-fold ministry offices did not start until we get into the New Testament and Jesus ascended up on high 
and they gave gifts unto men. Some of the old timers used to call it ascension gifts. You would have mean it? That would be scriptural. When Jesus ascended up on high, he gave gifts unto men. And so they call it ascension gifts because you didn't get them till he ascended up. And then he gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. So they are called by old timers ascension gifts and the words in the Bible. So I don't guess they're wrong. But we call it five-fold ministry. Brother Hagin called it five-fold ministry offices. It was a position and a place that you were called to. So that's why you don't see this because these offices were not fully in operation there in the Old Testament. And so that's why that words are used and not the five-fold ministry or something like that. But it's implied. Remember, we're looking at the Old Testament for types and shadows that go along and parallel what God is saying today in the New Testament. We don't live our lives in the Old Testament. We don't live, put it like this, we don't live under the ceremonial laws of the Old Testament. We live in the New Testament and we use the principles of the New Testament and apply them to our life. But there are principles of the Old Testament that are applicable to our life. And he said uh, here in verse, we'll just skip around here. He said in verse number 10, it says, For the land is full of adulterers, for because of swearing the land mourneth, the pleasant places of the wilderness are dried up, and their course is evil, and their force is not right. Why? Verse 11, For both prophet and priest are profane. And so we could bring that into the New Testament. And what he's saying is the five-fold ministry in the church today is profane. Now let's balance that out. That doesn't mean that everybody's profane. You know what I mean? Or everybody's wrong. Or everybody's in disobedience because they're not. Remember we talked about it this morning about how Elijah or prayed it out or something about how Elijah thought that he was the only one serving God in the days of Israel when the prophets of Baal were standing against him, you know, and Jezebel's after him and all that stuff. And God said to him, he said, I've got 7,000 that have not bowed their knee to Baal in Israel. Now that 7,000 was a very small, small percentage of the children of God. Very small. I think it's like 2 or 3% of the people that had not bowed their knee to Baal that had not got in disobedience. I mean, that's what God said. Because Elijah thought all of them had, because it looked so rough. And you know, and, and you can get that way today and get to thinking, well, my Lord. And of course, not to be a judge, but just common sense. Okay. Do you want the biggest shocks that I ever received in my life? Do you want the biggest shocks I ever received? Are you ready for this? You come to church for this. One of the biggest shocks I ever received from my, out of my life is coming out of prison. I'd had a Damascus Road experience on my third escape. Paul was on the road to murder Christians. I was on the road to rob somebody. But I had a Damascus Road experience, and I use that phrase because Paul had that. And, and I didn't have the same experience, but similar. I didn't see the Lord or anything like that. But I got saved, and I was called into the ministry. And I went back to prison and I started seeking God with all my heart there. And I ran into other convicts. They called us convicts in that day because you were a convicted felon. So that term convicts, you knew what you was there for. It's like one time I was trying to help somebody get out of prison in a federal prison. And uh, I talked to the parole board and these people on the federal level, you know, and this person's behalf. Uh, you know, and made an appeal because this person had been in prison for almost 30 years. And it was for murder, of course. And uh, had been in prison for almost 30 years. And so I made the, uh, you know, being a jailhouse lawyer. <laughs> jailhouse lawyer. <laughs> so I made the appeal, you know, from this standpoint. You know, prison is there, I, I assumed, to rehabilitate people and help them to go back in society. So I come at it from that jailhouse lawyer standpoint and mindset, you know, that certainly after 30 years of being in prison, the person is now rehabilitated, uh, that has no big things against their record that would be abnormal for somebody being locked up for 30 years in a cage like an animal. And I kind of went down that road. They politely listened. Everything was fine. 
And so I come to a stop. I was waiting for them to respond. And they said, uh, Mr. Greer, said, we are not trying to rehabilitate this individual. We are here to punish them. So we're denying parole. You know, they'll punish you in prison. They put you in there to punish you. But those same people go to a church and say it's wrong for God to judge them. But they judge them. Do you know Oklahoma actually executed uh, it this, this last year? I think you've already uh, killed three people. You know, in, what I mean, execute them in the government. I mean, they got the death sentence. And I'm not, I'm not saying the death sentence is wrong, but what I'm saying is those same people will go to a church and say God can't judge them, but they can judge that man and put him to death. It don't make sense. It don't make common sense. And it's not right. Isn't that right? But Oklahoma executed, you know, they, but lethal injection, I think two or three already this year. They have. No, they judged them and sentenced them to death. Yes, I said Oklahoma. <laughs> Oklahoma did. They done it. But again, you go to the churches and people that was probably involved in that was probably making the decisions, you know, on down through there. And I'm not just putting it all off on those that made the final decision or done it. I'm saying that. But what I'm saying is when it comes to, to judgment and, and making decisions and people receiving punishment for doing wrong, it's all right to punish everybody in free society. But when God tries to straighten us out and corrects us, then the whole world gets mad about it. God is love. God is love. God is love. Yeah, God is love. He loves you so much he'll beat you on the behind. I'll tell you the truth about it. <laughs> it's because he cares about you, you know. So it's all kind of messed up when it comes to that way of thinking. So anyway, he said here that the, the prophet and the priest, and this again, we're talking about bringing the New Testament terminology, and it don't mean everybody, are profane. In other words, the things that they're doing, the things that they're preaching, the things that they're communicating to the people are not correct. He says, Yea, in my house, in verse 11, have I found their wickedness, saith the Lord. He said, it's wicked. In my house. Now, this is not in the world. He's not talking to a sinner. He's talking to a church. Isn't that right? Verse 16, he says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you. They make you vain. In other words, you're out of your mind if you listen to them. Why? Because they speak a vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord. And what is the vision of their own heart? What is that? Verse 17, they say still unto them that despise me, those that don't walk with me, those that turn away from me, those that live more like the devil than they live like God. So the Lord has said, talking to these people that's living that way, you shall have peace. And they say unto everyone that walketh at the imagination of his own heart, in other words, doing evil and not following the word of God and the plan of God, no evil shall come upon you. That is a vision of their own heart, and it is not out of the mouth of the Lord in verse 16. But they're prophesying it, and these people... You know, in this day, we're notable people and people listen to them. But exactly when you come into this day, what happens when people are doing things like this that is actually leading the body of Christ astray, prophesying falsely things? When it, what is something that's prophesied falsely? And I'm not attacking anybody that we're just covering some ground here. When somebody prophesies falsely, what do we mean by that? What we mean is somebody prophesies and says, Thus saith the Lord, this will happen by the word of the Lord, and it does not happen. That is a false prophet. Thank you for getting excited. Thank you. Yes, it is. But because the church allows it and puts up with it and condones it and puts them on international TV saying that mess, because they don't know God like they should. Thank you for getting excited. <laughs> and the church embraces it. Nobody says anything. It's like it's condoned by the body of Christ. And it hinders the outpouring of the Spirit of God. It hinders it. 
because that is profane. It is unholy. It is irreverent to declare that something is God and it's not God. And you to stand up and speak for God, saying this is God when it's not God. That's irreverence. That is disrespectful. It's like spitting in the face of God, so to speak. Having no fear of God. So how do people do these things? Well, seducing spirits operate. We read in 1 Timothy chapter 4. You remember that? That in the latter times, some shall depart part from the faith, doing what? Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. How do seducing spirits seduce people? I've shared this before, but it needs to be shared over and over. We need to get the message out. Because a lot of people don't understand how they operate. The way seducing spirits seduce Christians. Listen, a seducing spirit is not after the world. They're already lost. They're already on their way to hell. These seducing spirits are after the church. Me, you. Try to convince us that something is wrong, that's wrong, is actually okay and it's all right. That's what seducing spirits do. Are, are some truth that's actually not godly or ungodly, it can, tries to convince us that that truth, that, that ungodly doctrine, is actually a truth that we should apply in our life. So the number one way that seducing spirits will try to seduce you or anybody in the church, number one, above all, and the Lord taught me this. And of course I could go through and, and that's not my message, but I'm just throwing this in. You know, this is free. Because we don't have time to cover every chapter and verse for it, but it just you can go study it out yourself. The number one way seducing spirits seduces somebody, a Christian, is through number one, through someone else that is already seduced by that spirit. That's the number one way that that devil operates. A seducing spirit, the number one way they operate to seduce the church is through someone else that is already seduced by that spirit. Already. And usually, the individual that is used by Satan is very popular, very well known, not all the time, because you had, uh, was it David Koresh down there? You know, and then Jim Jones over yonder? Am I the only one that remembers that? Well, I mean, that's really extreme to the extreme. But still, that's seducing spirits, right? I mean, people drink poison. You understand that? And then they had that fellow, I think, out there in California. What was he? Jordan, he must have done that. I mean, he was out there. My God. Remember, remember that fellow out there? that told them that the comet that was going over the earth, that was, it, was sending, it was sent by the extraterrestrials to come get them, and they all laid down on their bed and drank poison and died, and they come in there and found them? You've been locked up too long. I'm just... <laughs> Those of you that couldn't see, I was talking about Pastor Jerry. No, because he was looking. <laughs> yeah, these things actually happen. This guru, you know. This guru guy wore a long robe. He had convinced everybody that he had the truth. And this comet, remember, is going to come over the earth. You could probably search it up on Goggle or whoever it is out there. Yeah. Yeah, he convinced them people to kill themselves. Because if they did, they would catch that comet. They had to drink it at a certain time, you know. And they died. They all got in bed and died. Because they believed that there was their, their souls, they would call it, because they don't know anything about spirit, soul, and body, is going to leave and somehow attach to this extraterrestrial comet that's flying through the sky. Now that's extremes. But do you know we got stuff just as diabolical standing in pulpits of the church today? I don't want to hit it too hard, but whew, we do. We got these things going on. So the number one way of seducing spirit seduces the church. Seduces you, seduces me, is through someone else that is already seduced by that spirit. And that spirit usually works through someone that is very popular, very influential, and has a large voice. What do I mean by that? 
It's, it's be able to reach a lot of people, that's what I mean. And there's voices speaking in the church today, repeating doctrines of devils and that come from individuals that are operating under the power of seducing spirit. And I'll go a little further about that in just a minute. Seducing spirits. And it's all to do what? To deceive the church. So that's the number one way that the devil, a seducing spirit, tries to seduce me or you is through someone else that's seduced by them. But I guess I was blessed, or not blessed, by being in prison as a born-again, spirit-filled Christian. And remember, I was going to tell you earlier, remember, and I got on a side journey, I was going to tell you er, earlier, earlier, one of the biggest shocks, you know, and then I got your mind off of it a little bit and got your drug out here, and then we're going to bring you back. One of the biggest shocks that I ever had as a born-again Christian is to find out that people that I knew that said they were Christians sure didn't act like it. They looked like they was on their way to hell to me. When I got out of prison as a born-again, spirit-filled Christian, we sought God day and night. And I don't say that to put a feather in my cap or a crown on my head or nothing. But, I mean, day and night. You could say we had time on our side, you know. <clears throat> I mean, but God was our first love. Nothing else took the place of God. We dare not violate any principle of God's Word. We would not. We held, held each other accountable. We live with each other seven days a week, 24 hours a day. You couldn't go hide and practice sin. <laughs> we watched you. When I got out of prison and went to church, because I went to church right away, that was one of the biggest shocks that I found, is that people did not seek God like we did in prison. People didn't love God like we did in prison. People wouldn't sold out to God like we were in prison. And I'll tell you the truth about it. Not only was I shocked, I was very disappointed. Because I thought when you received Christ, you sold out, so to speak, and you took the bait, hook, line, and sinker, we'd say in the country. And I'm not getting on nobody. But I believe Christianity is a whole lot different than a lot of people believe. It's a whole lot different. And I'm not saying people are on their way to hell. But I believe they're going to be shocked one day when they stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> because there's more to it than just saying that I'm a Christian. More to it. So anyway, seducing spirits, that was the shock that I had. And disappointment. Great disappointment. But anyway, the Lord helped me, and, and I learned to shut my mouth sometimes. <laughs> but seducing spirits, remember, let's get back to that. Seducing spirits, the number one way that seducing spirit seduces you is through someone else that's already seduced by it. And usually, like I said, they will, uh, these, these people that's seduced by these spirits, and I'm talking about people in the church. I'm not talking about somebody outside of the church. The seducing spirit is not trying to seduce the world. They're not trying to seduce the Las Vegas nightclub. They already got them. You know what I mean? They're not trying to do that. They're not trying to seduce the juke joints around here. I don't know what they call them now. Speakeasy, whatever what they call them, nightclub, whatever. They're not trying to seduce them. They already got them. He's trying to work in the church. So the number one way is through someone that's already seduced by it, and usually it's an influential person that has a, a large audience or will gather a large audience. And that's going on right now. I mean, literally, right now, it's going on in the church world. False doctrines are being preached in many churches on Sunday, even in Pentecostal Word of Faith churches. Let me say that again. Pentecostal Word of Faith churches. Thank you for getting excited. You going to shout now? No. <laughs> and listen, again, that don't mean that every Pentecostal church is doing it. That don't mean that every Word of Faith is doing it at all. I'm not saying that. But it's going on. And I know people don't like to hear this. And I don't either. <clears throat> but nevertheless, it's true. So, the number two way that seducing spirits operate, if they can't get you to listen to somebody else, 
is they start speaking to you. And the, the story I told about <coughs> the pastor's wife that went to hell, the way she went to hell is because she listened to some thoughts the devil started putting in her mind. <coughs> so he came to her directly. Isn't that right? And he started putting thoughts in her mind. He said, you are a beautiful woman. And Brother Hagin said she, she was. She was very beautiful. And she had a very melodious voice. At every big convention, they would have her to sing because she just had such a wonderful ability to sing. And, and everybody just admired her, you know. <clears throat> and she, the devil would slip up to her. And, and Brother Hagin saw this in a vision how it operated. He told her, you're a beautiful woman. You've been cheated in life. You could have had fame and fortune and about anything you wanted, all the money you want. But here, you've been in this little old audience, in this little old church, with your talent, with your beauty, with your ability. You could have anything you want. Brother Hagin said he saw her, the spirit talking to her, and these things she said, start with, she rebuked you. That's what the Lord was saying. She rebuked you. Get behind me, Satan. Go on. Then this thing came again <clears throat> and told her, get behind me, Satan. But it just kept on going. This is a seducing spirit coming against this lady. And then all of a sudden, she began to take those thoughts for her own. Just because the devil comes to you and whispers to you thoughts don't mean you have to take them for your own. And the reason she took them for her own, Jesus told Brother Hagin, is because she liked to think that she was beautiful. She liked to think that she had been cheated in life. She liked to think that she could have a lot more than what she had. And so that thought that was outside of her, she meditated on it and thought about it over and over and over and over a period of time. <coughs> that demon that was outside of her moved into her mind. That don't mean that she's possessed yet. That don't mean she's possessed. But this thing is outside of her. She's just oppressed outside. But when it moved from outside, this thing was oppressing her. That's what Jesus taught him. It moved into her mind and it took up residence there. She became obsessed. Obsessed is when she thought about it all the time. And she just began to meditate on it. Meditate on it. How I've been cheated. How I've been left out of life. I'm so beautiful. i got such talent. All this kind of stuff. And she just kept meditating, meditating. And finally, Brother Hagin seen her in the spirit. Saw a vision and saw this thing move from her mind down into her spirit. And that thing took over. And Jesus talked to him about it and talked about how that she had turned away from the church, turned away from him and, and, and went with man after man and stuff like that trying to fulfill, the, you know, her desires or whatever, you know, or climb the ladder, whatever, whatever she was doing. And Jesus told Brother Hagin, he said, if she would have turned to me, you know, before she got to this point and asked me to forgive her, he said, I would have done it. He said, it wouldn't have mattered if she had a hundred men. He said, I would have still forgive her. He said, but now she's rejected me and the devil's deceived her to the point. And then Brother Hagin saw in the vision how that demon deceived her because the, the, the God sent a pastor to that lady at a hotel that was shacking up with people in a hotel. <clears throat> and this pastor went and knocked on the door. She came to it, opened the door. She had on this robe with nothing on it. And she had it open, embarrassed the pastor. And he come to tell her about Jesus. She said, I know what you come for. And I don't want nothing to do with it. The hell with Jesus. And slammed the door in his face. And I'm not cussing. Forgive me. I'm just saying. You know what I mean? And, and that's when Brother Hagin said to the Lord, Would well, you want me to pray for her? And he said, no. He said, well, why? He said, because she's going to spend eternity in the region of the damned. But it all started out how? With a seducing spirit. In your thought life. Listen to something that disagrees with the Bible. When it disagrees with the Bible and you continually pay attention to it, and you continually pay attention to it, you'll begin to believe your thinking processes and thought processes above the Word. That's why the Bible says and teaches us to meditate when? Day and night. Day and night. Day and night. And so that's how the Spirit took her over. And she became oppressed outside, then became obsessed in her mind way of thinking, and then that thing possessed her when it moved in her spirit. Now again, she had to meet certain criteria in order for that to happen. And Jesus taught him all that. You can go to the book, I believe it's in, I believe in visions, 
And it there where Jesus, he told about Jesus appearing to him. I think it was in, in uh, Broken Bow, Oklahoma, where Jesus appeared to him and taught him about devils, demons, and evil spirits. And it's in the book, I believe, is you can read it for yourself and get the whole, and I would encourage you to do so because I'm just telling part of the story for the sake of time because it's much more in depth and Jesus gives him detail after detail as to why this lady would spend eternity in hell. I can just tell you this, from what Jesus told him, it'd be hard to go to hell. Even as a Christian. If you're a Christian, it'd be hard for you to go to hell. Hard. Don't mean you can't, but it'd be hard, hard, hard. So quit trying to. <laughs> and I'm not saying you are. You don't understand. So it's not like Jesus is just writing us off. He talked about how he had, would have had mercy on that lady. So that's how those seducing spirits operate. If they can't get to you, I mean, through someone else to you, which that's their primary way, and they deceive millions upon millions worldwide. How many people are in false religions around the world? That's seducing spirits. How did the Mormon church get started? Because wouldn't it, Joseph went in the cave and dug up the tablets and Moroni came flying by. You know, I mean, you know? You know what I'm talking about here? Hey, I've been up to part of the northeast United States where a lot of this mess started. I accused them of doing it up there. <laughs> In those areas, but it's just amazing how that people can be deceived. You know, they, they got things and rituals that they do in these foreign religions, it's just so far out. And people that's lived in those cultures, and I'm not putting anybody down, but lived in those cultures, they could tell you some things, <laughs> you know, uh, of some things that go in there. My friend uh, uh, Jay Jeremy. Dr. J, I call him. He, he lived in India. He was a Brahmin high priest. And some of the rituals he had to do uh, in his religion was just, he said it was so demonic. He had devils in him, left and right. But, you know, how could that happen? A seducing spirit started working on somebody a long time ago. Until now, almost everybody in the nation is operating under that same spirit. And it's hard to get away from it. Children are raised in it, you know, and they believe it's right because they believe mom and daddy know. But uh, like my friend, the way he got out of it is Jesus appeared to him in a church. Somebody tricked him into going to a Christian church in India and tricked him into going to the altar call. And up there, Jesus appeared to him because he didn't believe in Jesus. He thought that was a bunch of junk. But Jesus appeared to him. He got gloriously born again, filled with the Spirit. Thank God. So the seducing spirits are here to try to seduce us. Now, when people start getting off, especially ministers, but it happens to Christians too. I mean, everybody. I'm talking about ministers are Christians, or at least supposed to be, you know. So I don't want to try to, I don't want to try to say, well, sometimes you wonder about things, you know. And I'm sure Dad Hagin has wondered about a few of these things, but. But, you know, I'm talking about everybody, but, you know, even as a Christian, you can be deceived. I'm what I'm talking about, everybody's a Christian, but I'm talking about if you're not in a five-fold ministry. So don't just put it on the five-fold ministry. I've met a lot of people that were deceived. A lot of people. Over the years of serving God, over 40 years of serving God. I remember one time in, in, a, in a meeting, we was worshiping God. I mean, the glory was there. You know what the glory is? The glory. The glory was there. And all of a sudden, one of my good friends, I said good friends, fell down on all fours in the floor and started barking like a dog. Well, it threw cold water on the worship service. You know, we have a lot of things happen in Pentecostal services. We don't have a whole lot barking like dogs. Do you know what I mean? When the dogs go to barking, you know something's going on. So he was down on his all fours just like a dog, and he was barking. And then, of course, the fellow that was heading up the worship service, he shut it down because it scared him. 
It did. It scared him bad. He didn't, he didn't know what was going on, but he knew that wasn't right. So the service is over, and so this guy went to him and said, what is it? He said, the Lord told me just to get down and bark like a dog if I really loved him. I said, you got a devil that told you to do that. What do you mean I got a devil? I said, you're made in the image of God, not the image of a doggone dog. Don't listen to that false mess. There was a book that was written, and one of the chapters in that book was devoted to animal utterances. Ladies and gentlemen, that's seducing spirits. And it was written by a well-known worldwide minister. That stuff is seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. You are not made in the image of a rooster or a dog. You're made in the image of God. And if you're going to act like anybody, God wants you to act like Him. He don't demean you to animal level. We're not animals. And you shouldn't act like an animal. You're yielding to the wrong spirit doing that. I'm glad you're excited. <laughs> I'm glad you're excited about it. But that came out of the Toronto blessing. I'm now, you're excited now. Yeah, my God. And I'm not saying that all of it was wrong, but it got wrong. How did it get wrong? They got off the word. Uh, you know, in Acts chapter, uh, what was that? Chapter 34? Or is it? Acts chapter 44, that's where it's at, maybe. It says, Paul fell down under the power and began to bark like a dog. Now, there, you won't find that in the Bible, so <laughs> I'm just making up the thing. Does it say that Paul done that? Does it say Timothy done that? Dad Hagen said this to me and taught me this and taught us all this. He said, if it's not in the Bible, I'm not going to accept it. Now, there might, not, there might be some things that happen that you can't explain. And he told me then, that's when you've got to be led by the Spirit of God because there may be some things happen. You know, because Jesus, when he, you know, spit in the mud and put it on the man's face, he didn't have no chapter and verse for it in the Old Testament. You know what I mean? But he was led by God and know this, he didn't do it every time. You know what I mean? But what people are doing is they'll have an experience, you know, and it will be God. But then they'll try to build a whole doctrine on it. You can't do that. You've got to have chapter and verse. And that's why we've got to be sticklers for the word about the Holy Ghost and the way he moves. So what happens is, he said this profane here in the Bible, and they speak a vision out of their own, our own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord. And they tell people that uh, walk after their own imagination, own heart, no evil shall come upon you. Well, how does this happen? Well, I want to talk to you something about familiar spirits. Familiar spirits are mentioned 16 times in the Bible. Familiar spirits. When I'm talking about familiar spirits, I'm talking about evil spirits. In fact, do you just want to look at a couple of those scriptures? Not all of them, but just a couple of them. Leviticus 19. Leviticus chapter 19. But again, it's, uh, seducing spirits is listed 16 times in the Bible, and every time it was God uh, telling them, or a prophet telling them, do not associate with familiar spirits. Leviticus 19, I believe is what you told me. And I'm getting there. Thank you, Jesus. So don't be barking like no dog. <laughs> Now, everybody in that room, that when that happened, when we was in this room, everybody that knew it was wrong. I just didn't know what it was. But I knew immediately what it was. You know what I mean? Not that I knew it all. Even the man that was there was leading it and heading it up, he knew it was wrong. He was a good Baptist fellow, you know? And, and I mean, it scared him. He got up and rolled his eyes up and said, I'm leaving. <laughs> Listen. That's a good thing. If you don't know what to do with the devil, leave him alone. That's, just, that's the truth. Just leave him alone. <laughs> if he didn't know what to do with the devil, he's leaving. <laughs> that's the best thing to do. 
Luke chapter 19. Leviticus. Leviticus. I'm in the Old Testament coming to the New Testament. Oh, or New Testament. Dude, I'm here. Here I am. Verse 31. 1931 of Leviticus. Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. And that what he said? Look at chapter 20, verse number 6. It says, And the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits and after wizards to go a whoring after them, and you understand what that means, I will even set my face against that soul and will cut him off from among his people. Woo! Woo! Look at verse number 27. This is what God, this is God speaking now. This is what God thought about it. Verse number 27 of Leviticus chapter 20. A man also, or woman, that hath a familiar spirit, or that is a wizard, practice witchcraft and seances and all that stuff, shall surely, what? Be put to death. They shall stone them with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. In other words, God didn't play with the devil and demonic things. He didn't want it among his people whatsoever. And again, this is uh, that, that uh, familiar spirits is listed 16 times. And we're not going to read uh, every one of them. But let's, uh, let's look at another one here. First Chronicles chapter 10. First Chronicles chapter 10. Aren't you glad you came? I am too. But the Lord's been dealing with me about this today. And I mean, I've been studying this, you know, as, as the Lord led me to. Remember, we were talking about studying a subject, studying something, and the Lord dealt with me this afternoon about that. Then in Second uh, Chronicles chapter 10... Oh, I'm in the wrong book. Second Chronicles, chapter 10. Are you there yet? Verse 13. Oh, it's First Chronicles, isn't it? First Chronicles. <laughs> is it? Yeah, it is. We're caught up tonight, I can tell you that. <laughs> I believe that comet's flying over. <laughs> He's swooping down to get us. <laughs> First Chronicles. I'm trying to get you straightened out here. But there's just so many of them, I'm skipping them, you know, and I'm... I'm Going because it's, it's some over there and some over here. First Chronicles chapter 10. Let's see if we got this right. Verse number 13. So Saul, this is talking about King Saul, that had been anointed by the prophet to be king over Israel, died for his transgression, which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not, and not only that, and also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it. And he and inquired not of the Lord in verse 14. Therefore he slew him and turned the kingdom unto David, the son of Jesse. So why did Saul died? Because he committed... He transgressed and committed evil against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord. The Lord told him, don't do this. And he said, which he kept not, in verse 13, and also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it, and inquired not of the Lord. Therefore he slew him. 
Isn't that right? Now, we know that the Lord wouldn't stand in there and actually physically killing him. You know, he allowed it or permitted it to take place. And we know that King Saul died. But notice what God thought about somebody disobeying him and especially about seeking after familiar, familiar spirits. Now you say, well, Brother Randy, uh, do people today seek after familiar spirits? Well, let's bring some ballots, if we can, to it, if the comet don't fly again. You know. <laughs> but uh, let's bring some ballots to it. Today, in the church world, because that's what we're speaking of, and of course, this is God speaking to his people too, and, and Saul was part of the kingdom of Israel. He was king over Israel, and he died because of his, dis his disobedience to the word of God, and seeking after these familiar spirits. Well, today in the church, we don't have people that I know of that go and say, familiar spirit, come and talk to me. You know what I mean? We don't have people doing that that I know of. If you, if you see them, it would be good, if you don't know what to do, to leave. <laughs> because that would be wrong. Isn't that right? And so today... It's disguised. It's masked. Y'all know about masks? It's masked. It's hidden in this way. People, it's easy to do, especially if you are very influential and you uh, have a lot of notoriety and you're highly looked up to you get into a place, especially if you don't pray and seek God like you should, that you're trying to come up with something new, especially in the prophetic area, and I can speak to that, in the prophetic area, that you come to a point that you're not hearing God's voice clearly anymore because you haven't sought God like you should, you hadn't walked with God like you used to, and you got away from God just like Saul did. Saul got away from God. And that doesn't mean you call for an evil spirit to come, but you start searching for something to say. And then you get into the competition prophetic realm. And you have competition among the words of the Lord, supposedly, that's going to speak to the church. And you got this one trying to come up with a bigger word than this one. And this one trying to come up with a bigger word than that one. And this one trying to make it sound more glorious than the other one. And so they get to searching or trying to come up with something. So they get in out of the Spirit of God and get into their spirit. And then the Spirit starts talking to their mind, these familiar spirits. And then the next thing you know, they are yielding to familiar spirits. And they begin to, what they call, prophesy something because they see it and it's just as real and it's a counterfeit spirit. It is just like the Holy Ghost. You've got to know the spirits. Try the spirits to know where they be of God. Not all the spirits out in the spirit realm are of God. But they get under such demand and such competition to come up with another word. Or they missed it on the last word. And so now they've got to come up with something more glorious and make it right because that word was wrong. And then they just start searching and searching and searching and again get out of the spirit into their human spirit and then the devil begins to communicate with their mind and they begin to think it's God. And they begin to prophesy, Hey, yeah, hey, yeah, yeah, hey, thus saith the Lord, yo, hola, hoba, yeah, yeah, yeah. I decree and I declare. And it don't happen. Why? Because they think that it's right. They truly believe what they said was correct and it's coming to pass because a familiar spirit has told them that. And so if they continue along that line long enough, and I pray that people wouldn't, but if they did and didn't wake up, any time that I, I've missed it before, 
I've always been careful to run back to the Lord and say, Lord, what, what happened here? You know, wh what happened here? Careful. Because I want to make sure that I don't want to get into this area of familiar spirits. Do you know that there's people on international TV almost on a daily basis in the church world that are operating under the power of familiar spirits? And I'm not saying everybody, but people following after them flock after them by the millions. By the millions. Because they don't understand how these spirits operate. Now, nobody's shouting now. What, what's happened? Nobody got quiet. Y'all didn't get caught up on that comet, did you? <laughs> it's sobering, really. And, and again, you can't get to the point, I can't especially get to the point that I think I know it all, because I don't. That don't mean that everybody's wrong, number one's right, because that's wrong. There's a lot of people right, a lot of people doing the right things. But it seems like that these false things have been given more prominence in the church than the truth. And that's what's causing us problems in the church world. I know ministers that if they come in here right now and you and just give them a little while, it take them a little bit to get over there and get in this, what they call the spirit, they can tell you your doctor's name, they can tell you your address, they may tell you your sister's and your brother's name, they may tell you who died and who died or what, but every one of them that I saw coming from this particular minister I'm thinking of, he's operating under the, under the guise of the Holy Spirit and his familiar spirits. Yes. One guy that I went to see back yonder in 1985. My brother and I went to the World Congress Center in Atlanta because this prophet, this, I mean, internationally known, internationally known individual, was going to be there. And my brother and I was just hungry for God. You know, we, we ain't never seen anything like this. We're going to go. He was the one to put in to go, you know. Come on, go with me. I said, I don't want to drive up there. You know, it's about the time we got in and everything. I said, it'd be a two and a half hour drive. It'd be late when we get back tonight. I said, let's, let's, ah, come on, let's go. You know, we want God. We want to see God move. We got up there, and that place was packed out. I'm saying it's seat, I'm guessing eight to 10,000, and it was packed out. Well, I wanted to use the restroom, you know, because we've been riding in the car, you know what I mean? And I wasn't going to rest, but they call it the restroom, you know what I mean? <laughs> and they call it the bathroom, but I wasn't going to take a bath, you know? <laughs> but uh, I'm just being truthful. So I walked in there, and there was lines because there's so many people. There's lines in this building. So I finally walked down this hall. I was by myself. My brother was still out there saving our seats because people were killing each other. <laughs> we used to do it at Raymond, you know. <laughs> then we had some Bible throwers that could throw them Bibles. <laughs> you remember them days? Yeah. Oh, boy, you get stampede going into that place. Because you wouldn't get in if you didn't if you didn't be there about two or three hours, maybe sometimes four hours before, you know, to get in because the building wouldn't seat, I think, but 2,200 down at now it's Rooker Memorial, you know. And they called it something else then. But anyway, I walked around this place, you know, and, and way around in the back, it got dark and the lights, you know, were just a light now and then like a night light would be on. And I think, well, man, I'm lost or something. I just kept going, and finally I come to a, a, a man's and a woman's restroom. And I could see, you know, on the door, it was very dimly lit, but uh, I just pushed the door open and walked right in, and it was a pretty large bathroom because it's a big center, you know. And uh, the lights were on, and when I turned the corner, there's a little wall, and you had to walk through the door and then turn right walk around the wall. When I turned around that wall, guess who was sitting over there on this little bench-like thing? The prophet of God. You know what he was doing? He was playing cards. Yes. This guy that was fixing to go out there and speak to all these people, internationally known, still alive today, still deceiving people today by the multiple millions. And I couldn't wait to get back to my brother. 
<laughs> I used the bathroom. Of course, when I went into the stall, you know, to use the restroom, then he, he's gone. But I'd never met him in my life. I didn't say a word or nothing. In fact, I was so shocked, my tongue was stuck to the roof of my mouth. I couldn't believe it. And so I went out, and I walked all the way back around that hall, found myself, and I got over there, and I got to my brother, and I said, we better get up out of here. He said, why? I said, you know that prophet you brought me up here to see? He said, yeah. I said, he was just back there in the bathroom playing cards. Ah, you lying now. You lying. You lying. I said, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I'm telling you, we better get out of here. We better get out of here. We better get out of here. I said, this, I don't know a whole lot. Especially I didn't know a whole lot back then, and I don't know a whole lot now. I said, well, we better get out of here. And so we didn't because <laughs> I'm following my brother, you know. I'm a protector of my stupid brother. <laughs> he got up, you know, and he put on this big show, and I knew it was demonic, and then the next thing you know, he stopped. And he called out a name. And then he said, now the person with that name, this is going to mean something to you. And he started calling out numbers. He said, I'm not going to call the last two numbers because it's your bank account number. And this is how much money you have in that bank account. Yeah, I'm telling you. And you're supposed to give me this amount of money at that account. That lady ran from the back. She was up in the back. She ran down through there and sat there and wrote him that check and gave it to him. Multiple thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars. And I thought, sir, won't you sit down? I'm going to get up here and call. <laughs> I want to get up here and call, call a name. Maybe I'll hit one of them, you know. Like pulling the lottery balls out. Maybe I can come up with something, you know, and I can get a couple of them numbers right. But I seen that man, he operated that way. I mean, phew. Brother Hagin, remember what he taught us. If somebody starts prophesying money out of your pocket, you better watch out. I mean, there's a move of God, and God can speak. You know, there's a balance to everything. But as a general rule, if that's what it's based on most of the time, you better look out. Amen? And I'm not saying that God can't. I remember one time being at uh, uh, Brother Hagin's meeting, and we took up what they call it. Wasn't it a heap offering? Remember that when they had the big baskets? And I mean, it wasn't wrong. I mean, it was God. But that don't mean you do it every time. You know what I mean? But remember that? It was somebody that was up there. You remember that? Well, you was there. I know you was there. You know? Yeah, they came before the flood. I know they were there. <laughs> I didn't get off the boat, boat with them. Yeah, they came before the flood. I came after the flood. <laughs> but it, it was amazing how God moved. And there was times that God moved. And there was times that God moved on Brother Hagin to say something. But it was very, very, very rare that it happened. But anyway, I, I, I saw that happen. And there's people today that operate that way. You know, and, and, and things that go on. And things happen in the church world. But anyway, people can yield to familiar spirits because they get so desperate to hear from God. In fact, can I tell on myself? Are you sure? Everybody likes me to tell on me. They like for me to tell on me. I have had a familiar spirit come to me. And he said this to me. And I knew it was a devil. And I put him in his place. He said, if you'll cooperate with me, I'll make you famous almost overnight. You'll have a worldwide international ministry so fast that you can't even dream how fast it will happen. 
if you will just cooperate with me. You know what he wanted me to do? He wanted me to sell my soul, so to speak, to him and sell out to him so that spirit could start operating through me because he's seen how God used me and then he would make me profane and he would make me false and most of the body of Christ would never know it and I would live like a king I wouldn't have one jet I'd have 14 I wouldn't have one house I'd have a mansion in every state because he'd make sure I did not that I desire all that I'm just telling you how that's the devil works he said if you'll just cooperate with me I'll make you famous overnight. Oh, let me tell you something. When you hear a voice speak to you like that, that is not God. You better run. And I knew immediately, this thing, I'm getting it away from me as quick as I can. I bound that thing, plead the blood of Jesus, because I knew what was happening. And I knew it was real. I mean, this wasn't no fault. It was real. But I also knew it was an evil spirit. And it was trying to deceive me. It was trying to get at something in me. And I'm trying to close, but y'all keep dragging me on and dragging me out. Remember Jesus said about Satan when it comes time for him to go to the cross. He said, no man takes my life from me, I lay it down. But he also told his disciples, I believe it was in the book of John. He said, Satan cometh, but he hath no place in me. If you've got something in you that you'll trade for something, the devil will pay your price. You know, he worked on Jesus that way. Remember when he tempted him? He worked on him. He gave him fame and notoriety, all the kingdoms of the world, the glory of them. Oh, that was real. That was a seducing spirit. It's a devil. Come after Jesus. And you looking at me like I'm funny. I mean, yes, that devil will come after you. But what happens is if people are not praying and not walking with God like they should and not around the right atmosphere like they should be, then that devil will get in them and deceive them. And I'll just, can I, I'm trying to shut up, but it's the reason you don't see me in certain places, there is a reason if you don't see me there. It ain't because I'm against anybody or hate anybody, but there is a reason. You know, it's, you got to walk with God. You can't open yourself up to things. You got to keep yourself pure. Pure. Thank God for it. Amen. Thank God for it. We, we better finish. We better quit. We better stop. We better do something. Because I've seen y'all got a pile of rocks out there and stuff. But did we learn anything tonight? Are we encouraged or discouraged? We're encouraged because we know the devil is not going to win. But we're just telling the truths. These truths, this message has got to get out. You know, we've got to, we got, and that's what the Lord began to talk to me about back in December. The message, and it wasn't my idea. You've got to get this message out. You've got to get this thing out to the body of Christ. You know, yes, we need to understand faith. Yes, we need to understand the truths of the Word of God. Certainly that. And I, I speak on faith periodically. But these kind of truths that we're talking about right here, first you've got to have a place of utterance for it. And then number two, you've got to uh, have a, a voice to be able to get it out there. And so the Lord was talking to me about this, this message needs to get out. People need to learn about these things. Because this is one side of the gospel that somehow we, we need, you know, the other side too. Don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with that side. But we need this side that talks about these things. And encourages about these things. Brother Hagin used to say in his meetings, you know, he said, when I go out, even in healing crusades in, in my camp meetings, he said, I've got one goal. He said, I don't preach the whole truth about healing. He said, what I try to do is bring people to faith and get them to receive in that meeting. He said, now, this is what he taught us. He said, now, I know, now this is not doubt and unbelief, it's coming to Dad Hagin. I know that every one of them in that meeting is not going to get healed. He said, but I go at it from that perspective because everybody's not going to come to that level. He said, but I don't have time to sit there and preach the other side and the other side. And some people ain't going to get healed till they make adjustments. 
And he said, I don't have time to, to get on that side. He said when he was in the local church and he was in there for meetings for six and seven, eight weeks at a time, he would have time to deal with people and, and work with people in small audiences. But in a large camp meeting like that, you couldn't do it. But he would teach us. He said, you got to go out there and preach and act like you're going to get everybody saved that there is. He said, but you ain't. He said, you got to act like you can get everybody in the building healed, but you're not. I mean, a sovereign move of God, certainly. And he wasn't saying it from doubt and unbelief. He was just saying it realistically because everybody's not on the same level. But you go with the goal to get people healed, you get people saved, delivered, and set free. Amen? Are you encouraged? Everything going to be all right? You're going to put the logs on your fire tonight when you get home. Amen? You might need to. Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we're following you, following your plan, and following your will. Following your will, following your plan, following your way. Now, this has come up in my spirit twice. And uh, I just want to obey the Lord because I know it's Him. For those that's called into the fivefold ministry, if you'll stand forward, the Lord wants to minister to you. Fivefold minister. We're going to pray for others. We've got other services, but this is what the, the Lord is saying tonight. You stand forward. You're called into the ministry. Thank God for it. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank God. Let's stand in the audience. And as you're standing there, just uh, begin to pray with us. Believe God with us. And thank God for the anointing that's here. Amen. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. Amen. And we'll start right here. Father, in the name of Jesus. For there is a level of the anointing and spirit that you have known. But it's not the end because I'm about to bring you along. And I'm going to bring you up into a path that you have not walked before in the Spirit. So when my voice speaks to you, you will hear it. And you'll begin to walk in a brand new way with the anointing operating through you on a level like you've never seen or known. And there will be an increase of the spirit of seeing and knowing, which is the revelation gifts of my spirit. And you will begin to minister and operate in a more supernatural way than you have up to this day. So trust me and believe me and it shall come to pass at last, says the Lord. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, it's not by might nor by power, but it's by my spirit that I'm working in your behalf in this hour. Because there's been a hunger and desire for more of me. And as you pressed in, you've wondered and you've asked, Lord, when can it ever be? Because, Lord, we've been plodding along. And sometimes it seems like that things just go wrong. But there is a time and a place that I have for you that you're about to move into. And a place that you're going to take in the spirit and the anointing of God will increase. And the spirit of seeing and knowing will be released in a greater level and a greater le uh, depth than ever before. Because I, the Lord, for you have opened this supernatural door. In Jesus' name. In the name of the Lord Jesus. In the name of the Lord Jesus. It's not over till God says it's over. It's not over till God says it's over. Regardless of the tests and trials that we may face and the opposition that may come our way, God has prepared for you a brand new way. A way that you will walk, a way that you will talk, and a way that you should walk in an anointing that you have not known before. Because he's been calling you into this place to run a new race. But if you get to thinking, the time is over. If you get to thinking, well, how could that ever be? Then you'll never be able to grab a hold to it and walk in it like I have for thee. So from this day forward, go after it and say, Lord, I'm open to it. And Lord, everything that you want for me, I want it. I want to walk in it. I want to do it. And you will see that the spirit of seeing and knowing 
will increase in your life from this very day. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Man's plans and man's ideas is not what we're after. It's not what you're after. But it's the way of God. It's the plan of God. It's the purpose of God. And as you present yourself unto him, which you have been doing, as you present yourself unto him, there'll be some molding and shaping that's going to happen. And what I see in the spirit is this. The potter is the one that forms the clay. So you're going to go in the, on the potter's wheel, so to speak. And it's all for preparation for that day. So don't be discouraged as he begins to lead you and guide you in ways that you have not known. But it'll be the Holy Ghost moving you along. And the spirit of seeing and knowing shall operate in a greater dimension than ever before. Because the Lord has prepared this supernatural door. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I speak a special blessing over every individual under the sound of my voice in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, say this with me and let your heart agree with it. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I submit to your will. I submit to your way. And from this very day, I thank you that you're leading me, you're guiding me, and you're directing me. And the supernatural blessings of God will abound in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. I've preached myself happy. You may be seated. I'm going to return it to Pastor.